Robin Hood is just something that's always been in the back of my mind since I was a, a little kid. I really, you know, I was a big fan of the various incarnations I saw as a child. Your next move will be your last. Robin Hood's every century. It's timeless. Robin Hood is a, it's a difficult subject matter to tackle because you think, well, what new can you say? To tell this story as epically and as real as we think it happened, is something no one's ever done with Robin Hood. Issues that it deals with are enormous. I mean, freedom, uh, you know, the rights of man. Every Englishman's home is his castle. If Gladiator was a metaphor for death, in this, it's about life, it's about birth. The scale, it's not an exaggeration to say it's monumental. I guess I've always felt like if we make this movie, Ridley and Russell and I, that it would be kind of the gladiator version of Robin Hood. You know, I wanted to experience the Crusades, experience a really brutal time. I was kind of worried about Wales because of the nine days. And it's entirely impractical because you've got moving water, moving boats, horses, troops in armor. So if you fall down in seven feet of water, you're going to drown. It was a, a nightmare. I don't covet roles. I, I'm never, I'm not like that. I don't, you know, I don't sort of ever have that, or oh, one day I'm going to do my Hamlet kind of bullshit, you know. <laughs> but uh, it was sitting in the back of my mind there somewhere. So when it, it came up, and it came up in a sort of oblique way. It began with Russell Crowe. It was a spec script that was given to me with Russell Crowe. There was a script floating around called Nottingham. And um, Brian said to me, you know, there's this revival thing of Robin Hood from a different perspective. Would you, would you like to do that? Well, Russell and I discussed, talked about it, and we said, you know, who would be the best director for this? And we both said Ridley Scott. Russell called me up and said, you know, we've got this Robin Hood thing. Um, let's engage. And um, I mean, cut a long, long story short, I did. Every studio bid for it, and, and Ridley presented it to Fox because that's the studio that he works at. Um, and, are his, and I'm at Universal and I ended up getting it. I was very enthusiastic about the possibility of a Robin Hood, but when I read the script, and no disrespect to Cyrus and Ethan, the guys that wrote it, but uh, kind of read like CSI Sherwood Forest to me, you know? And I just wasn't into doing that. It was essentially, you know, it's fair to say page one rewrite, because what they had and where we went were two different universes. I got a call from Ridley Scott, who was uh, gonna direct the film, and he said that he was involved in a Robin Hood film, but it wasn't the version of it that he wanted to do. And he wanted to do basically a version of the untold story of Robin Hood or the man before the myth version of Robin Hood. What we've tried to do is, is redefine the times, um, in fact, shift the timeline. Uh, we kill Richard instead of having him ride in and save the day. Um, but I think it's more historically accurate, in my opinion anyway, in terms of what, what the cultural melee was that a Robin Hood character could rise out of. We started back in 2007 doing research and scouting all over the British Isles, searching for the 12th century, looking for what was left. A lot of the castles and uh, ancient buildings, uh, unfortunately most of which from that period are ruins, we decided we would probably be better off coming back to the London area where most of our craftsmen and crew live and trying to recreate that in the studio with CGI extensions. The around. A lot of discussion and really evaluating where to put our resources. And then models, making models. Oh. 
Oh. Oh. Bounced right in the car, but it's all there. Cheers. We scouted for sites for Nottingham Town. The important thing there was to find a site where we could do most anything we wanted to do, as well as having a lot of very mature oak trees of great beauty. How old is he, do you reckon? That one there? Yeah. That's probably six or seven hundred years old, that one. We had a lot of cooperation from the National Trust, and we managed to get permission to use some of their forests, but we weren't allowed to disturb the ground, which is a great limitation when you're trying to build a, a whole town. So in the course of our scoutings, we covered different areas, and in one particular area, not too far from the studio, we found a private estate with ancient oaks and rolling fields and a beautiful topography and stream uh, with a very cooperative landlord who was very interested in film and allowed us to actually do everything we needed to do. Most of our burning was done, however, at Bourne Wood, where we had our uh, Barnsdale set. So we built an entire medieval town there as well, and also a French castle, which is where we shot the battle in which King Richard is killed. Barnsdale is the uh, acknowledged home of the legend of Robin Hood, so we had to include that in the movie. On the back lot of Shepperton, we began 16 weeks ago to build the exterior of the Tower of London. It's a fragment of the whole Tower of London complex as it would have been in the 12th century, and a part of London town surrounding it. There's an enormous scaffolding structure within it. It goes up about 65 feet to the top of the tower. It's quite windy, and when you go up to the very top, it does move a bit, which it's supposed to do, but it's a little unnerving. But um, it's still there. Ridley as a filmmaker, his emphasis is really on the density of the world that we're in, whether it's ancient world or future world or present world. It, it's like the attention to detail in, in the minutiae within the context of a much larger environment. For me, it's trying to create a, a 360 degree world that actors can immerse themselves within. There's a luster on this of like uh, granite right down here. Okay. And then there'll be an edge on this, we'll take it down yeah, so it's not down. uniform. Dust over the top of the core. Yeah, John, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, right. But generally fine. I think it needs a bit of an edge. Well, this is what we're going to do with the flocking of the horses. We electrostatically charge whatever we're going to flock, and we add different kinds of flock, different lengths of flock, different colours, and we grade it, and we turn it into the horse that we need on set. And uh, we've got about ten of them to do. In my department, I have a lot of people, and sometimes it can go, you know, I think I've gone up to as high as 145 in a day. Um, it's the usual on a big film, because you need a lot of people to do different things. We found thatchers. We've had to find people who are really good at hand sewing. I've had to make humongous items on this, and I've had to make tiny items. I've had to make really intricate pieces of jewellery and beautiful caskets. And then I've had to make big war cards. To tell the story, all those things are relevant, and so you need to source them. You have to have plenty of time, usually, to get them, and we don't. So it's a lot of pushing people and saying, you know how I said I wanted 20 baskets? Well, I need them today. And it's a bit like that. And it's like that every day, and it's relentless. It does not stop, it keeps going. This has been, this is the fake one. Okay. In order to get to the sort of, the feeling of this film, uh, my feeling of this film across, to Ridley, I do a sort of uh, several show and tells. He's always got loads of ideas, and he'll always come up with an idea, and there's always a sort of standing joke that the two of us have that he goes, you didn't think of that, did you? You hadn't thought of that, I thought of that. And I go, no, I don't, I've already, I'm already getting it. I've already got done that. And he go, no, you haven't. And you know, I have a very good rapport with him. But is that shellfish in there, is that onion? And I like to give him lots of things. It's very important. So if I do do a show and tell, I show a lot. So this is what Tuck um, makes yeah. himself yes. on the side. And he could make that. Our elder, she'll have elder wine. Yes. It smells great, no? Mm-hmm. It's lovely. 
I'll show animals, I'll show anything that, that is relevant to my department. And I hold it in the prop room and it's quite a big affair and we try to segregate different sections of the film and put things together that I think go well together. There they are. Yeah. Who's that? It's Tula. Where's Sheila? This is Tula. This is yeah. our scene. Oh, look at that. This is Jack. Is that Jack? Yeah. What a beauty. Oh, look at that fluffy. Oh my god, I want that one. The look at the one. big bear. <laughs> <laughs> Who's he? Who's this one? Ridley loves all that. And the more you can give him, the better. And you do need to think slightly outside the box. And that's what he likes. And that's what I like. And that's what everybody that works on this film likes. The first thing I actually did was to reserve every single item that we had made on Kingdom of Heaven and sold to a costume house, which enabled us to have 500 sets of chain mail, 2,000 shirts, 2,000 trousers, 500 helmets already in stock. So that was actually very advantageous because Kingdom of Heaven is set 20 years prior. We started with a million miles of fabric and we've used an enormous amount. We buy all our fabrics in, uh, most of them anyway, in Italy out of the warehouses where there are end of runs and uh, we get it very cheaply for anything between two euros and five euros because they need to get rid of it. Then for the more exclusive, more beautiful fabrics, we um, go to France. And also there's a lot in England that we use as well, especially for linens, wools, and cottons. Nobles, nobles, nobles. Peasants, peasants, peasants. There was an element of going very organic with the um, peasants, going very organic with the forest look for Robin and the Merry Men because everything was dyed, you used twigs to dye your fabrics. So it would always be an earthy tone. It would always blend with the background. We have tried to also give a good shape to accentuate the shape of each actor and their character that they're portraying. So although they really should look like they're wearing sacks, because <laughs> that was what they really did wear, <laughs> We've tried to flatter them. There's something that looks like metal but actually is completely rubber. Then we have leather, which um, is always a favourite of Ridley's. And then if you just scan round, you can see the extent of chainmail. We commissioned a shed load more chainmail from the Wetter workshop in uh, New Zealand, the Lord of the Rings workshop. And then we also bought 500 sets from India in riveted aluminium, which we don't give to actors because they have to wear it constantly, but extras are perfect. It's light enough, but it's not as light as the plastic. So Ian is completely responsible with Emily's assistance, altering everything to fit each particular actor as they come by, as they're cast. What we're doing now is adjusting them to uh, fit the actors. So that has to be done basically link by link. So you take sections out and remove sections and put sections in. So this is how the coifs come to us. This is before fitting. So basically they're quite loose and really baggy. It's Mark Strong's head cast. What I'm doing here is I am putting another section in to make it bigger. So what I've got to do is add links. So basically what I'm going to be doing is link by link, I'm going to be adding links in. So half the links are open and half the links, luckily, are closed. Mm, is it like that? No, it's like that. i got a guy just going, whoa, like a quack. That would work even Cut, sh bam, yeah. Pull him off his feet, and then drag him. Yeah. It's every kid's dream, isn't it, to be in charge of all the weapons? 
you know, you come to work each day, and you know, what are you going to do? You're going to shoot arrows and wield swords and make shields. You know, it's, it is every kid's dream. When we started a film like this, we knew we had to have loads of bows, loads of bows and loads of arrows. You bows, um, for this film, we will have made 200 bows from scratch. These have been made by our, our bow maker, Steve Ralphs. Yew wood is actually an endangered species and incredibly hard to find and expensive, so we have to find what the medieval bow used called the mean woods, such as ash, sycamore, elm, and even that is, is a hard task. So this material, this ash, actually comes in as flooring, and I have to get to it before the guys that make the flooring do. So I'm there Monday morning when the lorries come in saying, I have that one, that one, and I select the timber. And I have been known to make 10 of these bows a day, and it's, it, it's, it's very exhausting. Arrows, we've made 6,000 so far. We're probably going to get up to 10 by the end of the film. Producers on every film where we have arrows get quite annoyed at the cost of them. And I think it's only when you explain to them what goes into an arrow. It can't just be made from any old piece of wood. It can't shatter when we fire it. When we're manufacturing arrows, one person can assemble the arrow without the tip on it. They can do 40 in a day. Each feather that you see on these arrows, they've all got three, are hand glued on and then each one has to be tied on with these little bits of cotton here. So it's very labour intensive. A large percentage of the swords here have been made new for this film. Some of them have come in from other films that we've worked on. The percentage of ones we've made, we've been working on for about four months now, making all the component parts up. You're going to see a lot of shields in this film. Our hardest thing is to make a shield that looks realistic, but is not too heavy that the extra won't carry it. Because you can imagine on some films, you give the extra something to carry, it's too heavy, he'll, he'll lose it somewhere. The shields, it's a bit of a trade secret. We make them out of cardboard tubes. We've made all of our shields from these. Um, we cut the shape out of the shield, and then we'll start to build on that. I think it's, it's at least five hours for each shield minimum. So with 1,600 shields, you can see where the money goes. I know a great art director when I see one. I know a great stylist when I see one. I know a great costume wardrobe person when I see one. I know a great person who can do just the hair. The hair can fuck you up on the morning so badly you wouldn't believe when the, the wig is bad or something, or the, you know, you don't have to have a wig, it should have been grown. All these things come to bear and they're part of the decision-making process that I go through to form my team. Action, action. Ridley and I have been very patient since Gladiator because as you probably would realize that every man and his dog wanted us to make Gladiator 2 or another version of Gladiator, you know, whatever the subject matter is, just get on that big canvas together again, you know. And, you know, we've made th three other films since then. And the funny thing is about it, you know, it doesn't matter what we do, everybody always compares it to Gladiator, you know. Ridley very bravely at the beginning of the film said, you know, cut your hair exactly like it was at the beginning of Gladiator and let's have your beard that way too. And I'm like, oh man, people are just whinging and complaining. And he was like, look, if we're gonna steal from anybody, we might as well steal from ourselves. It's just a story, folks. It's a little bit of fiction, you know. Robin Hood, it's just fiction, you know, it's not real. I never met with Ridley. You now we got to remember that Russell said to Ridley, and Ridley trusted it. He said, "These are the guys that should be the merry men." And uh, Ridley said, "Okay." So the first time I met Ridley was uh, on the set, on the first day, and it was trial by fire because I remember we go, we got, we got to the set, and Ridley was, you know, he doesn't rehearse much. He said, here's what you're going to do. Hi, how you doing? Oh, good. Your beard, excellent. Grew it nice, great. 
Uh, you're gonna come down here. You're gonna walk up there. You shoot the bows. Da -da 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 -da. There we go. Eight cameras rolling, and you're just like, oh my god, you're kidding me. I'm not, and, and I'm still, that's really Scott. I mean, I'm still thinking, like, wow, look at, that's really, there's Kate Blanchett, and there. So you really had to just jump in. Well, when Ridley and I were, were talking about it in the beginning, you know, I, I said to him, if I'm gonna spend that amount of days with those guys, I said, they've gotta be 18. I don't want, you know, reputations and bullshit in the way. It's gotta be guys that'll work for Ridley the way Ridley wants them to work, you know? So I put forward a very short list of people and everybody on my list is in the movie. There we go. I'm just gonna leave that there right next to Whoa! There was one guy that, um, that was supposed to be in the movie but they didn't end up being in the movie. And fuck, are you gonna regret that? You dick. <laughs> Running down the hill. And I oh. <laughs> strangle. <laughs> One of the reasons that they wanted to assemble the team that we've assembled to play the Merry Man is that the dynamic sort of already existed in our natural lives. I mean, I've, you know, I've known Russell for six or seven years, and I've, I've known him the least. I mean, he and Kevin and Scotty worked together in 1998, I think. You know, and they've remained friends ever since. The very first time that I, I worked with Russell, which was 11 years ago, which is crazy. He makes fun of me now because I have gray hair. No one's gonna believe me who didn't know me beforehand, but you know, my name is Alan Doyle. You know, the character I play is Alan Adale. You know, it's like well, I, might, I might even be a descendant of his, you know, <laughs> in some way or something. <laughs> Alan Doyle, never been in a movie, never been an actor. You know, he's a folk singer from Newfoundland, but he happens to know how to play the lute. And I said to Ridley, I think that's very important if you're gonna have the guy playing the troubadour. Let's not have an actor sitting in the corner pretending. Let's have a guy who plays the lute, so if you don't like the particular tune, you can change it then and there. Action! We make a fine pin cushion! Keep it fast! We played a gig the night before filming started. It was in Vancouver, and I flew overnight from Vancouver to London. I got out of the airport, got in a car, drove down here, put on my costume, and 15 minutes later, I was stood behind a tree with Russell and a couple of the other actors, Kevin, you know, delivering a line in a Ridley Scott movie. It was literally that fast. I remember just stopping for a second after the very first take of the very first shot was done. I was like, wow, I'm in it now. Oh. Oh. Go for the butt cheeks, man. Go for the butt cheeks. Oh! <laughs> Most of the time, we are shooting real arrows in the air. And man, does that help when you're seizing a castle and you're retreating backwards and you're knocking it. But it also means that you have to learn how to grab an arrow and knock it, which is harder than shooting an arrow, by the way. To grab an arrow, knock it onto the string, and then do it, that's the hardest part. And when I first started, I take there. Took me like 45 seconds. Like it was like threading a needle. And Russell, Russell, Russell. If you're gonna fire a bow and arrow, then you should go and do a little bit of work on firing a bow and arrow, because the circumstances are never going to be perfect. You know, you're going to be firing while you're running, while it's raining. You know, you have to fire a certain mark in a certain place, so you need to be so familiar with that. Then it's the same as anything, whether it's a violin or a master and commander, or you know, a short sword and gladiator. You've got to make the thing that's part of your character, part of you. Russell out-researches everybody. He insisted on learning how to shoot that longbow, which is incredibly difficult. He trained for three months in Australia, his home, uh, till he became, you know, unbelievably proficient at it. Scotty and Alan are constantly having little competitions with the rubber-tipped arrows around the set between takes. And so they set up like a bottle and they were going at it for a while and they weren't hitting it, weren't hitting it, and then Russ said, can I have a try? I really haven't shot much with Russ. Russell goes, give me an arrow. And he gets up and 
I'm feeling like, oh god, here's Robin Hood. I hope Russell, my friend, I hope he gets it. I, uh, at least within 20 tries. He looks at the bottle, draws, boom. <laughs> Hits the freaking bottle. So Russell is the best. Alan is second, and I'm a close third on Alan's tail. I knew what Willie's work looked like, but I didn't then know the specifics of what made them Ridley Scott movies until I showed up on the set like this one, and then you wonder, how do we do this burned out looking castle? Well, let's put a castle up there and burn it out. There was a, a couple of times when I'd go stand next to Ridley and watch him at the monitors and just kind of see what he was doing. And the best way I could describe it is, I think it's almost exactly like watching a, a painter, a master painter. Uh, Peter, that might be better going wider, but you see the top off camera. That, I want Loxy closer yeah. into the shot, basically. Instead of the palette with the paints on, he's got a walkie-talkie. And the canvas is this wall of screens, which is like his 12 cameras, you know? And he's looking at each one, and you know, he's got kind of dabbling in his little paints, and he's saying, okay, I need, let's put 100 horses here. And needs a little smoke coming out in the back here, you know, and on the other side of the walkie-talkie, people are scrambling, putting that stuff together. And he's just kind of going through it, etching in his details. And it's not just about visually being cool. It's about how that's going to affect the story. Oh, mate, go for it, mate. Um, messy, messy. Messy, very messy. Cut it, cut it, cut it. I was on a ship two days ago in Virginia water. They built a ship and we were on it. Where Arthur Max is, is truly wonderful is he's really into preserving all of these crafts. In, in England. He's very passionate about the kind of the loss of skill base. They actually went to the length of populating the river area um, with coracle paddlers. Coracles are ancient little boats. Each one of them was completely authentic. So there were three guys working on the set who had all handmade their own coracles and were paddling around this beautiful big galleon. My favorite set on this one would have to be the Royal Dock because it was probably the most difficult on lots of levels. It was difficult in terms of getting permission because we're in a crown estate, a property of the Queen's estate. It's a royal park. It's a protected environment. It's an immaculate piece of nature. And we were going to build a jetty and build a continuation of the Tower of London that you see behind me dovetailed within ancient trees, which if we had to prune a branch was a two-week negotiation. I would say this is gonna be one of the last movies that they actually build the practical sets like they built on this movie. You know, they just don't do it anymore. I would like to have lived in any one of the films I've made. You've got to want to occupy that space. And I think that's what's good, because when I walk in a room, you feel the room, and the actor walks in the room and feels the room, it's, I think it actually is a great proscenium for them. So I think it, you know, brings out things they hadn't thought of, maybe. What is that to me? My brother's troubles are over! Oscar Isaacs as King John has been a personal revelation to me. I mean, he's just, he's a very, very clever actor and he's having a ball. And that's one of the key things in this movie. Every single person in this cast has been having a lot of fun, you know, and I think that's probably gonna be reflected in how the film comes across. So, taxation. Taxation? Milking a dry udder gets you nothing but kicked off the milking stool. Mother, spare me your farmyard memories. You had them, and I don't understand them. When thinking about John, I kind of came up with this 
initially this idea of, you know, I'd say Robert Plant meets Richard Nixon, you know, some kind of a uh, kind of mix of the two, uh, <laughs> you know, this hedonistic kind of rock star thing mixed with this very intense political um, paranoid mind. Uh, and I know Ridley had a good chuckle when I mentioned that to him. <laughs> Than this way. I never met Kate before, and let alone worked with her. I hadn't thought of her mainly because I thought she wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> it was actually Russell that reached out to her because he knew Kate Blanchett, and he said he saw her in a social setting in Australia, and, and he just, he's so charming, and he really charmed her into doing the movie. We had other ideas at one point and both Ridley and I started to think they needed to be of a kind, Robin and Marion, they needed to be similar creatures. It just so happened that at the beginning of this year in Australia they made me into a stamp, right? Doesn't happen to you every day, a bit of a special occasion. And there was a function because they'd made Nicole Kidman, Jeffrey Rush, and Kate Blanchett into stamps as well. So there was this function. And there's Kate, and I've known Kate for a long time, but we've never been mates, never been buddies, always been friendly with each other, but we've never, you know, we've never worked together or anything like that. Girl. And so I'm sitting on the stage with her at this function in Sydney for a thousand people. And I realized that this is the person, you know? Her demeanor. Everything about her, I was, I was kicking myself. And why didn't I think about this before? You know, it should have been such an obvious choice. So when the microphone came around to me and to say something to this thousand people who had gathered, I took the opportunity to ask the crowd if they thought it was a good idea if me and Kate should make a movie together. And a thousand people loudly supported the idea. The way Ridley spoke to me about it, which I found interesting. There's a little bit of the taming of the shrew in there, in that you've got Petruchio and Kate, you, you've got someone who's a bit of a match for, for Robin Hood. You know, to, to be a sparring partner with, with Russell was something that I thought, yeah, I, I'd find that, you know, quite exciting. That is a waste of resources. Here, Mr. Video Man, come here. Nice and quiet, everybody. This is why our budget's fucked, right? I'm off camera and he's using resources like this glycerin when there is absolutely no reason oh, to. Oh my <laughs> God, oh my God. <laughs> so irresponsible. The various sort of film incarnations of Robin Hood tend to be a bit fey, you know, a bit limp-wristed. And that's one thing you couldn't call Russell. <laughs> And there's very, very few of them around. He's a man. Robin Longstreet. You know, as a woman working in film, you do relish the chance of, of working opposite a man. And he's found a real earthiness in Robin. And given that the film is moving towards people moving into another way of thinking, which is the world of the forest and the, the pagan mythology and those values as opposed to the values of the church and the state, I think that that's a really interesting quite modern take on it. Once we've done the biggest battles and we've got them tied off, the village scenes are kind of, you know, when somebody says, oh, we're only gonna have a battle with 400 people today, you think, oh, that's gonna be an easy day. They transformed this one area about an hour and 15 minutes out of London into Nottingham or the north of England. And it was remarkable. The first day I got there, I just was, kind of blown away. Ridley makes sure that he can do these master shots that actually can encompass, you know, the depth of, could be, you know, a thousand yards. It's, un, it's pretty unfathomable. You, look at you, look at you. I don't think I've ever worked on a film with so many cameras, because Ridley, on a sequence like that, he's got nine or 10 cameras set up. It's a bit sort of Big Brother-esque. You don't quite know where the, where the cameras are, so you're, you're not playing to one sense of audience, but you know that the, the action is going to be shot in its entirety. So it, it might take a while to rehearse, but once everyone knows their part, then you actually can play a scene, a bit like a theatrical scene, where everyone's going for the same common goal and you know there's a beginning, middle and end to the sequence. 
the interesting thing is is the kind of acceptance or, or people just assuming you can do this stuff you know because you turn up and you're wearing chain mail and you've got a sword on the ransacking of York. I, I arrived on set and they went, okay, we're gonna have some guys pushing a door and then uh, that's not gonna work and then two horses are gonna rear up and smash the door down. You're gonna come charging through in you because you're galloping, you're gonna take somebody out on the right-hand side, then you're gonna stop the horse by the monument, slash somebody's head, ride round the monument, see in the distance that the village is on fire and gallop off. And you think, um, okay, yeah, well, you know, I'll give it a go. And it gets you close to realizing how phenomenally difficult all that stuff must have been. I mean, wearing the chain mail and the armor, these guys must have been barely able to move or almost have some kind of superhuman strength. Or fights literally consisted of a few blows until somebody went down and couldn't get up. And then, you know, they got a sword through the visor and it was all over. <laughs> Oh, dude, you hit the flag. You hit the ribbon. Oh, I'm not even close. Wow. What are you judging me for? Now this comes out, and you show the 57,000 times it took to hit this bottle. Not even close. I'll kill you. Oh, you hit everything but it. <laughs> Simon here makes all this stuff and knows how to use it far better than we do. Dude, I mean, I can't, I don't think I can get any closer. Simon and I worked on Band of Brothers together. Yeah, he was a lousy oh. shot on that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> but he's pretty tough on the arms, right? It looks like. Uh, yeah, but you, again, it's like muscle memory. You, you just get used to it, it doesn't. Oh, he <laughs> one shot! Oh my god, prick! <laughs> you just made me look really good saying all that great stuff about you. What shot? That was Thanks, guys. fabulous, man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he knocked the stick, knocked the stick <laughs> down. Oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> this is the life of the merry men. This is just an excuse this movie because we've been just wanting to hang out and get together and have fun. <laughs> what sort of a freaking wedge is that? But I can ride a horse. <laughs> this has just been, I'm not kidding, the greatest time of my life. Go. We've, uh, you know, we're barbecuing all the time. We're, we're staying yeah. close to each other. On the weekends, our families get together. And it's really been, uh, it's, I'm gonna miss it. It's been a close family. <laughs> Ah, whales! <laughs> Russell has really brought us together in a way that um, I haven't really experienced on other films. He, he has brought the four guys together and we feel like a team, like a unit, like a band. It's an honor and a pleasure to ride with them, eat with them, sing with them. You know? get to live here, you know, it's been uh, pretty goddamn amazing. I was in the boat before. Oh, if I give you that, it's got a buckle, you know it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walk straight no through, take a shield, take right, it. No See you later. On a kind of normal day, you know, we've got sort of four or five hundred extras in in the morning, and around about 6.30, quarter to seven, they'll start to feed through our tent. So what we do is the guys come with a costume number on a tag, which they present to us. We then hang them onto the clipboard. This enables us to issue a belt with a weapon. They then put the belt on, they'll depart down the bottom of the tent, picking up a shield um, and going into the waiting area. A lot of them 
at the beginning of the film don't know how to tie the belts up and so you're having to help them and that slows the whole process up but eventually after a week or so of it they're getting into the swing of it what they've got to have they're coming through telling us what they need you know i need this shield i need that right, you take a shield down there yes thank you very much and sometimes they'll hold a lot of their own continuity they'll tell us what they had the day before you know we might say well it doesn't matter it's a different scene but thanks great you know that's good all right. yeah. For every 100 people that are on screen, there are between 50 and 60 people off screen. So on an average day here, we have a minimum of 200 extras. So that means that I have 100 to 200 people you know, extra on top of that every day working with them. So when we get to Wales and you're dealing with extra counts of 800 people on beach plus 200 horsemen every day, you're dealing with 1,000 people. That means you've got another five to 600 before you even get to the people that are out in the boats doing all the, you know, the marine unit kind of stuff that we had going on there. Thank you very much. How many more spears do we need? Half past seven, eight o'clock, we send our main team off to the, the set. We'll get our guys to go down and start to look at the principals and arm them up while the extras are still going through. And eventually, you know, around about sort of nine o'clock, 9.30, they're all on set and we come together as a team. And that's when the battle kicks off. I'd never really done any horse riding before, and they threw me on a horse, and even right now my groin still is, is hurting really badly. Just uh, muscles I've never used before. Uh, but I loved it, I love the horse riding. It's, I think it's something I'm gonna try to keep up. and stare at the beach, which I've obviously wrecked it and chosen it, and then you arrive in the morning and there's 2,000 people there, then you get a definite stab of fear. You think, oh my God, how long have we got to do this? Nine days, that is totally impractical. It should be more like, um, that should be more like a month. The scale of it has been an amazing privilege. West Pembrokeshire and Wales. We had nine standard cameras, a steady cam and a West cam and a helicopter. In Australia, we'd say that's bigger than Ben Hur. There were so many people, in fact, that the first AD realised there was no point in shouting action and cut because everybody couldn't hear. There wasn't even any point in having a microphone and a, the Siskas still people couldn't hear. So action and cut was basically one of those red klaxon horns. The finale of the movie was originally supposed to be in Nottingham. It was supposed to be here on dry land with people like hacking away with swords and things like that. Eventually it evolved into this sea battle. By that time we had built a lot of the equipment. So, you know, when all of a sudden they said, this is it, we're all going to immerse everybody in the sea. You could see two or three departments just crumple. You know, wardrobe were thinking, oh my God. I was the same. You know, all the leather belts will turn into Rice Krispies. They'll all start crumbling and dying. And we had to spend ages every night putting oils back into the leather work. The scabbards started to fill up with water. You know, imagine a scabbard full of water all day long. You bring it back, you heat it, you come in, it's like a banana. So we had to be very careful and gradually dry things back, which became a nightmare. We had to pull the plug every day at six o'clock. There was no and ifs or buts because I did French hours, which means there's no lunch. So you go in the morning, you get your breakfast, then you begin. And then during the day, somehow, vaguely, somebody hands me something to eat. And that's how people ate. They ate on the hoof. But by doing that, it's incredibly efficient because you don't stop. Stopping psychologically disastrous because people stop, they go into a warm place because it's cold, it's winter. They eat, they get drowsy, and then it's another hour 
getting them back out and get up to speed. So you lose two hours in a day when your light's going at five o'clock. So we went the other way around and people moaned and did a deal saying, okay, but we have to drive away there at six o'clock, that's it. So it was kind of annoying because on most days I was driving home in the best light. completely exhilarating Wales. I mean, we didn't know what the hell we were going to be doing next. You know, we were governed by the tide, we were governed by the weather. It was old school filmmaking. It was a massive event and thoroughly enjoyable. I think the, the beach scene worked out pretty good. I knew I had to deliver, but as I say, I was worried about it. And uh, I think we got everything. Films like this don't get made very often anymore or probably won't be made anymore. There is something to be said about the actual craftsmanship, the work that goes into actually making it a three-dimensional thing and having it be there alive in space. And I think that it, it's reflected in the performances, it's reflected in, in the extras. It's an infectious thing. If you've ever been inspired to like really fucking kick some ass. It's like working on a movie with Ridley Scott because it's balls out and every person in every single department is like the best at what they do and giving everything that they've got. It's just an absolutely inspiring experience and, and it kind of scary because you're like, oh wow, what movie am I gonna do after this? <laughs> you know, like after working with him been incredibly generous and um, we've had a lot of fun, a ton of fun uh, making it. Hello Stewie. <laughs> you right? Is that close enough, lad? One more castle to sack. Then we're home to England. The editing process makes sure no one falls asleep. Right? That's always the focus. How can I tell this story swiftly without losing the full meal, the full ingredients? It's how do I sustain the characters? How do I sustain the energy? Action, in a funny kind of way, is relatively easy, but I think you can action out. You can get bored eventually with just action, action, action. So it's how do I play that? I have it all, you've got to have it all. It's very hard to say what that is, but you've got to have it all. Sadness, sadness, it only needs to matter. By God. Can we go in there? By God, can't you sing us a happy tune? Yeah. After so many years, you know, there's a, a comfort level there where, you know, we don't have to discuss a lot of things. It's, it's understood. During the, uh, the filming part, you know, we, uh, we watch dailies. Uh, I build. Uh, he likes to, um, to see as, a, as, I, as I work. Uh, he likes to see the scenes. He comes on weekends. We get a sense during the filming, how uh, this uh, movie comes about and, and grows. It's always an exciting point in the filmmaking part to see the first cut because it's like giving birth. I mean, that initial, is it a boy or a girl? What, 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 what do we have? That's the same, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, an exciting book involved. When you start with a 144 page script or whatever it was, it's going to be a long movie. There's a lot of characters, there's a lot of stories to tell. So our first cut ended up being three hours and 25 minutes. And it works well, it has its own flow, but there's just so much. And that's scary. <laughs> that's, 
<laughs> that's the pain you get and have to face that. And you have to say, okay, how am I going to lose at least an hour? I mean, think about it. You know, you got to lose a third of the movie. New exit, this is a new transition. Yeah. Richard's army is coming home. I think that's a good cut. Yeah. Do you, uh, you want to see it with the chapel or no chapel? I'm just looking for the place for the chapel. We played around a lot with structure, moving different scenes around, different beginnings. Do we start with the kids? Do we start with Robin? Do we start in, in the battle? How long do we have of the French siege at the beginning? How much do we need of uh, the setup, you know, of where he comes from? How much do we want to tell about uh, the Crusades? Yeah. Great, that's a good fix. Then just jump along in there. A lot of times um, a scene or sequences are cut, you know, 20, 30 times. And I think we have really good dialogue in terms of not being precious about uh, specific things, that we are at the service of, of story and character and we're willing to try many different cuts and ways uh, to tell the story. That mouse was really expensive because he's a rock climber. That mouse cost 250 pounds. <laughs> he kept swinging off the edge of the bowl and falling and going, oop, oop. Russell was complaining, saying, what the fuck's going on? And then he saw the film, he suddenly said, oh, the mouse was taking all that time. I said, yeah. Do you like it? He said, yeah, I love it. Pietro? Yeah. Going from their dancing, nose to nose, yeah. you go to the old boy, off that look he once came from knowing that Marshall was talking to, to Robin, right? And off that, you put his line in over that pre-lab, do you believe a blind man can see in the dark? Boom, go to this. Just because one person said he didn't fucking get it. And but that, we're not listening to that person. I'm not. Okay, then we're don't. Not. But we, we mustn't, we mustn't lose, like... you mustn't lose the mystical aspects of the film. Because well, they're not. quite su successful. Just because one cynical fucker says he doesn't get it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah but that's a, I'm not listening to him. Right, good. You know, opinions don't... Um, bother me as much. I actually like to listen. I, I show the film to uh, my crew, to assistants. I like feedback. I like how people react. Ridley and I have been through this process many times before and uh, when you get feedback, sometimes if something is in the back of your hand and you already know it, it just reinforces and, and says, yeah, you know what, several people are saying that it is an historical point. And other times you just disregard other things and say, that, that's, that's silly. I don't care. It's uh, really, really good about that. Blind man can. There you go. This is the psychologist. Do you believe a blind man can see in the dark? A blind man can see things in the dark. Do you believe that? Do you understand me? Psychologist. Yes. Close your eyes and leave the remembering to me. Psychology. Medieval psychology. I love music in film. I like to work with music when I edit. I don't cut to some musical piece, even 10. I like the rhythms of the dialogue and the visuals to have its own rhythms. I usually complete the full temp soundtrack. It's a way for me and Ridley to get familiar with, with the tone of the film. And, you know, there's always things that I, I miss from my own temp track, uh, but you know that's part of the evolving process of uh, how a film comes together. And fix those spots. And, and, and we do it. all the stuff, uh, woodwinds, we just do it in a seven pass. So just do a string, cool. string pass first. Fantastic. Jolly good. All right. Thanks, Sam. Cheers, Sam. Good 
We are at Abbey Road right now, Abbey Road Studios in London, and um, we're um, downstairs in Studio One, the big room. Well, yesterday we had a 90-piece orchestra. Today uh, we have strings and brass separately. So we have right now 75 players downstairs. And um, yeah, it's an amazing place to work. Mark was my music supervisor for years. And then the first thing I asked him to do was, because I figured he's a musician, his choices of temp were always excellent. Temp score were always excellent. Sometimes not what you thought of. And what's interesting, sometimes we work better than you thought. But that's always a good sign. You've got a musician in the head of that person. And I, so I gave him a good year, and uh, he dealt with that really well, effortlessly. And then I gave him American Gangster, which is a big one. But I thought it was big in the sense it was supported by a lot of music of the time and the period. But I think he did really well. Then Body of Lies. Then he's into really creative music writing. And then this is a real test for him. You have to be partially acknowledge the idea of what it is in terms of its classical nature. And therefore you have to acknowledge that a little bit. So I think he's done really great. Really, he tries to uh, encourage certain ideas, but he doesn't just say, okay, you know, just do this, do this. He kind of shares his ideas and um, sees how much I feel I can pick up on that. And um, I think it's, it's, it's helpful, you know, have conversations with Ridley. Um, he, there were certain things about instrumentations, you know, I mean, we talked about the 12th century, we talked about Celtic influences. Yeah, but then we should probably first pick up that stuff around 40. Yeah, exactly. Just went through email, yeah. really. Okay. I'm trying to use a, you know, somewhat authentic elements in the score. I think nobody really knows what authentic uh, music of the 12th century is because it's always, you know, translation, we have a vague idea what it would have sounded like, I guess. There's some um, older versions of, uh, you know, violin or a hurdy-gurdy or things that existed during that time. They definitely give the score, you know, different character or at least those, you know, the pieces that I'm using them in. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to kind of blend those sounds with, with, orchestral, with orchestral sounds. The first time you hear the music for a new movie being played live is an amazing feeling. Your music kind of becomes real, you know. Before it's almost like a, it's just a theory, it's something you just kind of, I don't know, made up in your head and uh, it, uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, comes to life when it's recorded, when real players, when human beings play it. And um, to me that's, that's also you know, a great part of it. What I hope that people get out of Robin Hood is first be gigantically entertained because that's what it's designed to do. And it's an empowerment vehicle. And that's what Robin Hood as an origin story is. It's lush, it's accurate for that period. And it um, reflects you know, Ridley's epic style of uh, filmmaking, something that uh, sometimes gets lost. I hope the best for the film. I'm very proud of it. The son, he asked me to do this. My goal was to have all that entertainment and scope and scale from a historical film, but still have the audience say, I recognize that world in my own world, because I don't think the world changes very much over time. People still fall in love, people still betray each other, people still have 
trouble paying the rent, and they have all that in Nottingham. We have paid in money and men for King Richard's wars, and we have no more to give. Burn it! Films are not history lessons. They pull in and use and manipulate history to kind of tell a great story. It is an adventure, and um, you know, but, but how that ends up, will, you know, will be in the mind of Ridley Scott. Archers to the cliff top. Cavalry to the beach. We will wait you there. Good. With me! Archers! Maybe this is the last time I'll ever get to work on this sort of scale, the way the film business is going and the way the audience is shifting what that audience require between, you know, marquee tentpole movies and, and cartoons and stuff, you know. I mean, even if this is really successful, I'm not sure that we'll ever actually make up that ground. You know? And who knows if it's going to be successful. I mean, if you're coming to this because you want to see all the things about Robin Hood you think you know, you're going to be severely disappointed because <laughs> it's going to take some left turns that you could never assume. I think people will want to see a gigantic action adventure movie about the beginning of Robin Hood. And he kicks ass, you know, and people like that. It's, it's uh, you know, there's an empowerment quality to what Robin Hood does. I don't think any of us are cocky about it at the moment, you know. We know it's been a magnificent experience to be involved with and all that sort of stuff, but, you know, Ridley's, he's taken some risks on this, you know. Um, but without taking those risks, it really wouldn't have been worth doing. I'd love to do a sequel. I mean, I really enjoyed, particularly enjoyed doing this film. I think people like fantasy, but I think they also like reality when you can really hit it and uh, I think we clip this really nicely. It doesn't really read as a period piece. You just engage from the opening seconds and you're in.